everyone. It's so good to be back with you again this week, and I'm excited to share with you uh, from, uh, from the Word of God. I want to talk primarily uh, on the second chapter of Acts, uh, which is, as you know, it's the famous chapter with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where there was a gathering together of the followers of Christ, and uh, and, and, and there, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and, uh, and then uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and uh, there were people who were gathered there uh, that uh, experienced something that was quite a phenomenal. Jesus, prior to that, Jesus prepared his followers for that event. He had spoken of it back in the book of John where the comforter would come when he had left. And he also prepared them, as we can see, from the book of Luke. Now, I want to share, and that's where I'll begin, is in the 24th chapter of the book of Luke. But let me just share with you that uh, Luke not only wrote the book of Luke, he was a physician, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And each of these writings were uh, actually a letter to an individual that he mentions in the beginning of each one of these documents. Uh, So the first letter was the book of Luke, which speaks of the life of Christ. His second letter speaks, it was the book of Acts, which speaks of the acts of the Holy Spirit. So let's just begin here. And in the 36th verse... It has Jesus standing in the midst of some of his followers, and he said, peace to you. Now, this is Jesus that is right after the resurrection. He is appearing to people, and he is, uh, in some sense, bringing about a transition from the time that he uh, was with them, and now they had seen him go to the cross, and he uh, is now raised from the dead. It is this, this has been three days since uh, he was killed on that crucified. And so his appearance now is going to create quite a bit of disharmony in people's thinking. Uh, you know, how can someone be so completely together after such a horrendous beating, brutality, uh, and and then the the death on the cross itself. Uh, But yet here he is. And so you will see now in their shock, they become terrified, they think he's a ghost, and he's going to prove himself that he's not. So let me begin in verse 36. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, And suppose they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see as I have. So it is such a shock that it's hard to believe there could be a physical resurrection Uh, Certainly it has to be his spirit, but no, he's physically there. And not only did he ask them to handle him and to notice that he has flesh and bones, but he also had body organs. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands, his feet. While they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said, do you have any food here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. So here was the demonstration, the helping them to be aware, getting past the shock of the, of the uh, loss at Calvary and realizing that the resurrection is real, uh, that truly there was victory, you know, at that cross. So now once he convinces them of who he is, Then he shows them scriptures. Israel was a nation uh, that was led by prophets, 
uh, Moses in particular uh, was the major one, all descendants of Abraham. And Moses was one who was responsible or who was active in God giving the law to Israel and delivering them out of uh, slavery and bringing them into a rich promised land in Canaan. And so, uh, and, and so there have been, even since Moses, other prophets, Isaiah and, and uh, Joel and uh, different ones. And, and so the country lived according to the word of the Lord as spoken through the prophets. And prophetic uh, words were considered even as the voice of God. And even as they are today, the written word of God uh, is that voice still speaking in to our days. And here we see where Jesus says to them in verse 44, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So now they're able to understand and comprehend uh, messages that, re, that uh, prophesy the events that they are seeing in their lives. And so he goes on to say, it is written. And thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. If you remember, he had said that there would the sign that God would give would be as the sign of Jonah, who as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the belly of the earth. And, and so then he says, in repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And of course, the preaching of the name of Jesus is continuing even in our day as it began back then. And you are witnesses of these things. In other words, you are the one who has the opportunity to see this, to experience this. And witnesses, typically when we think of witnesses, we think of uh, those who are called into court that have, have had an eyewitness, a, an observation of an event. And uh, they are, their job is to uh, present what they saw factually and truthfully uh, under oath. Uh, witnesses have to have credibility. Uh, they have to be have a history of know, knowing that they live a, a, a certain a, with certain standards and moral character. That they're not prone to to uh, differ to defer from the truth. And so then uh, you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Now the promise of the Father that's going to be sent upon them is in reference to the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that will come and live inside of us. Live inside of us. The Spirit would come upon people, but now the Spirit will come within people because our hearts have been cleansed, our sins have been removed, and we have been no longer under a curse, we are under the mercy and grace of God because of the blood of Jesus, because he is alive. And so here are his instructions. He says, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. Stay in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And so then he leads them out. As far as Bethany, he lifts his hands, blesses them. And while he was blessing them, he departed from them into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. And so here we see now how uh, Jesus has given them the instructions to go and to gather in the upper room. And so here they are in the upper room. And if you look with me in the uh, book of Acts, and uh, I want to go ahead and go directly to the second chapter of Acts, and we'll look at the first verse. 
It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And these are the same ones now that Jesus had spoken to, had told them to gather in the upper room. You can find more details in the first uh, chapter of Acts, but I want to focus on the second chapter of Acts. This is the beginning of a new era. This is the beginning of a new covenant that Jesus had brought forth. And covenants are made with blood, and his blood was shed for the covenant of mercy and forgiveness of sins, that, there, that our relationship with God has been reconciled through uh, this atonement, that we have been delivered from the bondage of our sins and brought forth into the uh, sanctification of his blood and and uh, and 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 uh, the sacrifice that he has made, and so we are now able to receive that which comes from God, which comes from above, and this is what's happening here. Chapter verse two. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. So they heard something. And it sounded like wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then they saw something. There appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And each one sat upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with the other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here is a supernatural uh, phenomena, experience that is taking place. And... Uh, and then it goes on to talk about particularly the impact of these languages because there were, in verse 5, it talks about that there were many people who spoke uh, from other nations who spoke in many languages. And, uh, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem. And so it says, verse 5, they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So here these people are from all different nations and they have different languages that they speak. And there are these people who are gathered in an upper room who hear a sound and see tongues of fire, and they begin to speak in other languages, unknown tongues to them, yet the people who have gathered are able to understand what's being said, each in their own language. And so this is that experience. So they were amazed, and they said to one another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? In other words, these people who are speaking are from one language, yet they are speaking in different languages. Verse 8, and how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And it goes on and lists a whole different areas that they're from. And, uh, and so, they, so, so then it goes on, to, so it talks about the areas that they were from, Arabia, uh, Cyrene, Cretans, Medes, uh, just many, some I can't even pronounce. But in verse 11, Cretans and, and uh, our Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So here's what they're talking about. They're talking about the wonderful works of God. And, uh, and, and, and they're, they're, do, they're speaking Galileans, but they're speaking in languages that others are hearing in their own language. And it's about the marvelous works of God. And, you know, this is an opposite of what happened with the Tower of Babel when people were exalting the works of their own hands and they were getting a name from their marvelous works and God confounded their language. And there were many languages that were spoken, but no one understood the other language. Here, they're speaking the wonderful works of God, and 
other languages are being spoken, but everyone's hearing and understanding in their own language. And so they say whatever, uh, and so they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? So these were people who were impacted a certain way. But then there were others who weren't. Uh, others were mocking, verse 13. And they said they're full of new wine. These people are drunk. They're full of new wine. So some wondered what this meant because it shocked them because they heard him speaking the wonderful works of God. If you're drunk, you're really not going to be, you know, doing that. But anyway, uh, it looked as though they were full of new wine. And, uh, and Peter now stands up in verse uh, 14. And when Peter stands up, he wants to give them an explanation of what is taking place. Now, Peter had been told he was among those uh, who were there when Jesus was raised from the dead. And his eyes were open to the scriptures. And he knew that this was a prophetic fulfillment. Because Jesus had showed them. And we read it in Luke, uh, Luke's last chapter where uh, Jesus explained to them and gave them understanding as to what the prophetic words meant in the Old Testament, the Psalms, the books of the law, and, and, and the Proverbs, all those uh, Old Testament uh, uh, and the prophets. And so Peter had a revelation of what was going on he had an understanding of what was going on because the Lord had, had made it clear to them even before uh, that he came after he was raised from the dead uh, that the comforter would come. So Peter is going to now explain what's happening here. And so Peter standing up, verse 13, with the 11, that is uh, the, le the 12 apostles, so the 11 represent the other apostles, so all 12 of them were there, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be made to no known to you and heed my words. And uh, verse 15 is a very famous verse of scripture out of, uh, out of the, the second chapter of Acts. He says, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so now he's speaking from the prophet Joel. And you can, you can, you can look this up in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, if you wish. And so here's what he's reading out of Joel in verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. In the last days, says God. Second chapter of Acts is now talking to us about the fact that we're in the last days. It shall come to pass that in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream uh, dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, all signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, and before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I read about the sun being turned to darkness, it immediately makes me think of Christ and how the sun was covered in darkness, when he, when he died, when he was on, was on the cross. And so, uh, and so Peter is making it clear 
This is the new time and a new season. We're not going to just hear from this one that's a prophet, such as an Isaiah and, and, and such as a, an Ezekiel, but we're going to hear God's voice from many other places because God is pouring out His Spirit upon all of us who are here. I can hardly speak about this without weeping. It's just really overwhelming to think how magnificent of a gift that God gave. He gave himself. He is the Holy Spirit. He is the Son. He is the Father. And here, this is pouring out Peter explaining, and he explains not only what's happening, but he explains what took place for this event to come forth. So he, verse 22, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him. How clear can that be? Which God did through him. It didn't say he did them because he was God. He said God did those things through him to, to, to show clearly that he was sent by God and, and he was supported. He was, he was God's son in this earth. And then it says, God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the predetermined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. So now he's saying that this death and crucifying that the Jews had done, he's speaking to the Jews, and they were, could not literally do it, but they pressured Pilate into doing it. He wanted to get out of it. He did not see that what was, what the actions, he did not see that the consequence was, uh, uh, was, was a product or was a reward or, you know, a consequence for something that, uh, needed death, Jesus was innocent. And he knew because his wife had a vision or a dream and she, she told him, this man is innocent. And Pilate didn't want to kill him and so he sends him to Herod. And Herod sends him back. And, well, that's, that's another, you know, story are a part of, of, of this story. But basically, Peter is pointing the finger where it truly lands, that it was the hierarchy of, of Israel, and that is the priests and those uh, who were responsible for having him crucified. But he says to them, God already preordained it. It may, it, he, he preordained it. And he says, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that, she, that he should be held by it. And now he's speaking and defending his report, again with another prophetic. The other earlier one was the prophet Joel. And now he's speaking from what David had said, and you can find this in Psalm 16, 8, 8, through, 8 through 11. He says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may be shaken, may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. And moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades. So here, uh, Peter is pointing out by revelation that has been given to him through Jesus Christ when his eyes were opened 
And Jesus instructed them in the scriptures and how they pointed to him. And so, so here Peter is saying, uh, or quoting David, David saying, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Now, so he said, you have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. So David saw corruption. Peter's going to point that out. You can go to David's grave, and he's in it. But Jesus did not see corruption. And he was not left in the belly of the earth. And so, verse 29, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He's both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. All right. Now we see where the promise, and, and there's scriptures that speak of that, where God had promised that there would never be uh, uh, any, but of, it would always be his heir would be upon the throne forever. And that is the Christ. And this is the fulfillment of that promise. And Peter knew this because his eyes were open to understand those prophets when they were speaking of Christ and what they meant. And he, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. And he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell or Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Remember, Jesus said, you're all witnesses. You all see. I have been raised. Touch me. This is not a spirit. Give me something to eat. And, you know, and now here is the evidence of the scriptures. Sit down with me. Let me show you what has been written and prophesied, pre pre preordained, pre-told, even the cross. All of that is the plan of God to bring salvation. The same God who brought the curse is the same God who fulfilled the curse. And therefore, we are no longer under it. This is big news. And Peter is announcing it. And he's announcing it for revelation knowledge. The same Peter that denied him three times. And yet the same Peter that was called by the resurrected Christ into ministry three times. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Feed my lambs. He called him to speak. And this says, and then he goes on to say, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. Now he's saying where Jesus is. He actually saw him go up into heaven. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. This is that promise. This is that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is heaven touching earth. This is God releasing his presence. And from the, from the heart of his grace, rather than the wrath of his judgment. And then goes on to say, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not send into the heavens but says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord God, the Father, said to the Lord Jesus, sit at my right hand. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you cross crucified, both Lord, Christ. And now when they heard this, 
they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, I, that's what I feel like, the hearts. <laughs> uh, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter told them, here's what you do. Life application, here's what you do. He says, you repent and you let every, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, and as many as the Lord our God will call. And so it goes on, and he even says more beyond that. But I want to go ahead and leave that for you to read later on, and I want to read you some verses of scripture and that is Joel 2 28 through 32 and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and on my manservants and on my maidservants I will pour out my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to point that out to you right now. There may be some of you who are listening and as you have heard, teaching about Christ and the promise of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit coming and, and, and then it says here for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved uh, if you're here listening tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ it's not very hard to do so all you have to do is call upon the name of Jesus to be saved Ask him to come into your heart. Pray this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I don't know you, but I want to. I'm asking you to come and come into my heart to fill me with your spirit. I, I, I am so sorry for the things that I have done that are against you. I want to make you Lord of my life, and I want to be a follower you and your truth and I pray this sincerely in Jesus name Amen if you have spoken that prayer tonight and you were sincere about it uh, God is doing something uh, inside of you and it would be so important for you to share this experience, this moment that you are having with someone who you know would appreciate it and do as uh, Jesus had, uh, Peter had commanded from this moment of repentance and this moment of salvation. Follow Jesus in baptism and go to a church and receive baptism and then dedicate your life to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ by getting into a church or Bible studies and individual prayer time and individual study in the Word of God. I want to do what I generally do uh, in closing with each and every one of you, and that is I want to pray God's blessings, that God will bless you with the blessing of Abraham, that he will bless your finances. He'll cause you to be the lender and not the borrower call you to be the head and not the tail and that your children will be blessed and taught by God himself and they shall have favor with those who are in authority with them and there shall be a governing of the influence uh, that they receive but it will be the influence of the almighty well may his face shine upon you and his spirit rest upon you and I'll be looking forward to seeing you again in 